Hey folks, now this lecture, this video is the one where I think I can get a little bit more excited. This is the second in our The Future of AI series. And in this one, we're gonna talk about Lady Lovelace's objection. I've been telling you that AI is going to take over many, many industries. Not, especially if you've watched the previous video, not the world, but it is going to reshape and transform many industries. It is going to change the nature of work. It is going to change the availability of work. It is going to change what we see as our work. It'll automate many tasks. It'll collaborate with people to do others. But what can and can't it do? What will and won't it be able to do? I touched on this idea a little bit in our Six Kinds of AI video from maybe a month or so ago. Can a computer do creative design? Do you have to watch out for your job? I think if we're gonna answer that question, first we have to talk a little bit about what do we mean by design? So let's say there's definitely two different kinds of design. There's routine design when you have some design problem and you kind of know what you have to do. You've got a good plan from the beginning, you carry out your plan, it works and you go, yep, good enough and you ship it. That's the kind of thing you might do if someone asks you to put together a bunch of wireframes in a couple of hours, you time box yourself, you get stuff done, you ship it. Maybe there's some good ideas in there, but it was pretty routine. You didn't have to confront any seeming paradoxes. You didn't have to tackle any wicked problems. It all just sort of followed from your experience and from your methods. And then there's creative design, which seems to happen more likely when there are obstacles to the obvious, when it's a tricky problem, when you have to stop and rethink, reframe how you're approaching it. We're talking now about that second kind, because clearly routine design, like, hey, we need a new axle for this race car. It needs to be cost less than this. It needs to take these certain number of forces. It needs to be this maximum weight and it needs to plug into a hole this big. Okay, go computer. That's a really well specified design problem and optimization problem. And computers are already used for that kind of designing in engineering all the time. But creative design, when you don't actually know what all the specifications are up front, is it possible for a computer to do that? I'm also not talking about the latter half of a design problem when you already have thought about a concept, when you've already got an idea, you've already got a framing, you've already got a perspective you're gonna take in solving this thing, then you move into a computer and have the computer take over for you. That's the same thing, that's the routine part. The detailed design is not what we're interested in. I mean, AI will 100% change how we do that. It's already changed how, say, Photoshop works. Half of the features in new version of Photoshop are powered by what we would call AI, or at least would have called AI a couple of years ago. How can AI help us with the creative part of designing, the early part of designing, the conceptual part of designing, the framing and the negotiating and the understanding of the problem? So that gives us a different framing of our question. We've started at, will computers take your job? We've gone now to, can a computer be creative? And I got to admit, this is my jam. This is the kind of stuff that Liam and I love to be working on. And I'm super keen to sort of bring you behind the curtain of this computational creativity stuff. So what does creativity mean? Well, the truth is, having been in many conferences on this topic, the whole field argues about that all the time. I want to just end run that whole debate. If you're really interested in what creativity means, ping me on Slack and I'll hit you up with way more papers than you might ever wanna read. It's a super deep question. But for now, let's say that a creative design is one that is original or meaningfully new and also useful, like appropriate for whatever the design task it is. If something is merely useful, then it's just good. It's not creative in any way. And if something is merely original, then it's just weird. If it's, if it's not good, if it's not useful rather, then it doesn't matter how original it is. It's like a rubber kettle. So we've reframed our question again. Can a computer produce original and useful artifacts? And now we get to a fascinating figure from history who I can't actually remember if I've brought up previously. Ada Baroness Lovelace, a daughter of the poet Lord Byron and longtime collaborator of Charles Babbage, inventor of the difference engine. Charles Babbage proposed what is effectively an analog computer, a general purpose uh, calculating device, general purpose mathematical computer that could solve systems of equations. Babbage's device was never built because there simply wasn't the money to machine that many precise parts. It just would have taken 
the output of a nation to produce some of the larger designs that he put forward. And since this was happening entirely analog, as in in gears and wheels and flywheels, it required the size of a factory to be able to do any meaningfully scaled uh, computation. But even though Babbage's designs were never actually brought to fruition, the Lady Ada Lovelace, born Ada Augusta Byron, and this is the middle of the 1850s, by the way, uh, speculated on a bunch of really fascinating directions that this sort of technology would be able to go in the future. Quick patriarchy aside, Ada Lovelace was not permitted to publish really in any of the scientific journals of the day. Most of what we now know about her contributions to the field come from a translation from the works of a French mathematician. She translated this, uh, this, this other mathematician's work into English, which people thought, oh, what a great service for an ed educated young woman who hasn't yet married to do to the scientific community. And then she provided tens of pages of her own notes and speculation in the margins of that translation. There's more scientific contribution in her margin notes than in many of the actual articles of her peers. But of course, we didn't acknowledge her or they didn't acknowledge her at the time as the principal contributor. When speculating on the capabilities of the analytical engine, she made a quote that Turing referred to some 80 odd years later. The analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. Sound familiar? This now is Ada Lovelace's ghost answering my question about whether AI is going to take your job. And she says no. If you fast forward to Turing, who wrote in 1950 on another paper on will computers be uh, intelligent. Turing, we of course know, as a man was allowed to publish these things, but later in life, he was chemically castrated and then uh, committed suicide because he was gay. Again, not relevant, just a little patriarchy note for you. Turing said, in specific reference to Lovelace's objection, machines take me by surprise with great frequency. By which he meant, no, machines are, seem to originate things all the time. Because Lovelace, thinking like a mathematician, had thought that if you understand the parameters that went into the machine, then you would automatically understand every possible outcome, even if there was some randomness involved. If you were to make a little computer program that can draw stuff to the screen, then you would know every possible outcome, even just having put the randomness in. And what Turing's saying is, no, 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 it's trivially easy to make a program complex and emergent enough that you won't understand every possible outcome. And thus the machine has the capacity to surprise you. And isn't that what being original means. Now, of course, at this point, we could get into a deep and meaningful discussion about whether being original is the same as being surprising and whether novelty and expectations are the same or different. But obviously, that would be an absurd rabbit hole and a waste of a research career to go down. So I'll simply pop up nine of my papers on the topic there for you if you're interested. Uh, but moving on, let's get back to the practical idea then of whether computers will be able to do a creative designer's job. I think one way to approach that question is to ask what lesser versions of that capability have already been achieved. So we can start with the simple version of the question, can humans use AI to be creative? Absolutely, 100%. Artists, technologists have been using AI in creative ways a ton over the last 50 years. Solved. Next question, can AI augment human creativity? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. You can look at how engineers will use AI algorithms to produce better designs. You can look at how AI researchers use AI in the design of AI. Anyway, you have to deal with huge tons of data, you look at interactive visualizations and intelligent interactive systems. We've been talking about this now for quite some time. Clearly, AI can augment the creativity of human users when embedded in a system with a good interface. So what's the third part of the question? Can an AI collaborate with a human in such a way that it actually does some of the creative stuff itself? Well, to phrase that a little bit more uh, scientifically, can it take on some of the creative autonomy? That is the creative decision-making capability. 
could an AI work with a human in such a way that the human would later say, oh no, some of those were its ideas, not mine. What does it look like when humans exercise their creative autonomy? Well, good thing is we have a history of research in the cognitive science of design to help us answer that question. So come down uh, one last rabbit hole with old Kaz for a second. This is a part of a sketch from a student architect's designs that was studied in a cognitive science paper back in the 90s. This is uh, Schoen and Wiggins' work. The student was asked to put together a design for a public school, which required six classrooms. Here's their first attempt. Oh, looks like there's kind of a ridge along the site. Let's put six classrooms in a line following the topography. Oh, hang on, they say, looking at their design. It actually seems a bit like a set of stairs from, from the side. So what about if we kind of lean into that and have the risers and the flats of the stairs. Let's do three L-shaped pairs of classrooms. You've still got your six classrooms, but, but now they'll look a, bit like, uh, look a bit like this. Oh, hang on. If you look at that, it actually forms this nice indoor outdoor space. There's, there's kind of this space, which is kind of sheltered from two sides by the other classrooms. And that'll be really useful for separating kids of different age groups. You could have like your one and two kids, your three and four kids, your five and six kids, but not totally walling them off. It's still one playground, but there's these little nooks that might help the kids feel more comfortable. Isn't that a bizarre thought process. Every single one of those steps that this student architect had taken, and it's not just a student thing, by the way, we observe these patterns in uh, architectural professionals and in designers of every other domain and level of experience. There's no rationality to that thought process at all, right? They seem to hair off in a new, unusual direction and come up with some new idea, but still somehow make a good design in the end? I'm sure you've observed this in yourself, right? You actually do your best designing when at least early on, you permit yourself to flit around and try out absurd stuff. And cognitive science backs this up. People who are more willing to reframe their designs early on end up with better designs in the end, as opposed to people who latch on to a specific uh, framing early on and don't let go. They tend not to produce as creative a design. So what's actually happening here? So Schoen talked about this process of design as a reflective conversation with the medium. What did he mean by that? To him, you started with an internal design representation, basically an idea, some representation of what you were working on inside your head. And then the natural thing to do with an idea is to draw it, to take some action to produce an external design representation, which is what Schoen called a sketch or some thoughts or some dot points or some stickies or whatever. You would then observe that external representation and in doing so, see something or at least potentially see something that you didn't put there. You would be surprised by your own sketch. And this is the key point, the connection between Turing's ideas of a machine with the capacity to surprise and these ideas about creativity as original plus useful. Design cognition is a process of sketching things and then kind of seeing things that you didn't really intend to put there based on some synthesis out of your past experiences and the thing that you just drew. That surprise will send you off in a new direction that'll help you explore some tangential or similar idea. And by repeating that a bunch of times, at least during the conceptual stage of designing, you'll explore the space a little bit and come up with something that is hopefully a good design concept to go forwards. Without that capacity for self-surprise to see something that you did not put there, you won't be able to do that creative exploration that cognitive scientists say is such an important part of developing a creative design. So what then would an AI that can help you do that look like? That can potentially push you off in some of those surprising directions. That can augment your creative process by taking on some of the creative autonomy. Well, here's a couple of examples from my own previous work. This is the Creative Sketching Apprentice, uh, which was part of a PhD student of mine, uh, Pega Karimi's work uh, in the US five or six years ago. It was work done also with Nick Davis and my mentor, Mary Lou Meyer. So this AI observed sketches that you had made. Those are the ones in the left-hand column. And in this, it was just sketching any random thing just as part of 
uh, testing the AI. But you could, uh, you could make a sketch in any, any kind of thing. And then it would suggest a sketch from a very different kind of thing, a very different category of object that it thought was somewhat similar. So you draw an axe and it'd say, hey, that axe looks a little bit like a dolphin. The idea here is to uh, send you potentially off in a new creative direction by making this juxtaposition. Hey, that toothbrush looks a little bit like an aircraft carrier. I wouldn't say that boat looks like an aircraft carrier, but that's another story. Hey, that dumbbell looks like a baseball. That bridge looks like a rainbow. That one I can definitely see. That ceiling fan looks like a flower. The misspelling in ceiling has bugged me in this slide for five years. I've never gotten around to fixing it. The idea here is to build a machine that knows when something is visually similar, but conceptually, as in, in terms of the meaning of the word, distinct. You did have to tell it what class of object that you were drawn, but in doing so, it could go find a similar drawing from a very different object. And it's that sense of trying to push people, trying to inspire people to try something different that we think is a valid approach to trying to get this AI support for creative thinking. Another project along the same line involved food. Let's say that a computer and I have one that did this, can identify some weird combination of flavors that may or may not be good, but would certainly be original. And in this case, it's come up with vanilla and Parmesan cheese, because it says, after having looked at a big database of a million or so recipes, those almost never appear together, or perhaps don't ever appear together. But that's clearly too weird, and it knows that, for most people's palates to appreciate. Boy, with a sentence like that, I'm glad to have a pop filter. So it needs to start you out on something similar, but a little bit more accessible. And so we built this system that can take you on these journeys towards appreciating something truly weird. It can say, all right, I've got this idea for you, but we're gonna start with fig and mozzarella, which is a, I mean, not an everyday combination, but something that you may have heard of and something that I gotta tell you is awfully good. But mozzarella is a little bit like Parmesan and fig is a little bit like vanilla. They're in the same kind of flavor profiles. And then maybe you try that in a couple of recipes or give that a little experiment for a little while. And then it comes back and says, oh, you like fig and mozz now? I got something for you. Cheddar and chocolate. If you're a weird foodie like me, you've definitely heard of this, but it's a combination that some people have talked about on the internet. It's certainly not anywhere near as mainstream as fig and mozz, which is hardly mainstream to begin with. But it isn't as weird as parmesan and vanilla. So it gets you to try that out, maybe whack a couple of squares of dark chocolate in a toasty. And then after you come back and say, hey, that, that wasn't actually that bad, I could do that. Then it says, all right, now you're ready for the really weird one. Now, of course, this is just a toy, just a little exploration. But the thing that we're trying to get a hold of here is what would it look like for a machine with a higher tolerance for the unusual than you? because we can dial a machine's preference for the weird up or down as much as we need, to start leading a designer who might be stuck in a bit of the familiar, might be fixated on something that isn't too original. What would it take to start gently pushing someone, to give someone some breadcrumbs towards an unusual idea, to start to try to jog someone out of the familiar? And we think that this sort of idea might eventually lead to systems that can help augment creativity in that way. But all of these things come back to the same problem. Autonomy, creative autonomy requires, that is the creative decision-making requires figuring out what's a good aesthetic for a particular problem. It requires interpreting because there's no list of aesthetics somewhere. You have to make one, you have to interpret an appropriate aesthetic that is appropriate look, feel, vibe approach from experience. Or at least that's how we do it. We as designers come up with a good look, a good vibe, a good feel based on our experience with similar products. And without experience and without the capacity for interpretation, maybe for at least a little while, AI will be prohibited from being truly creative, from truly taking on the creative autonomy. But until then, there does seem to be plenty of ways that a smart machine can inspire creativity in humans. Ways by understanding 
the cognitive processes of creativity that we humans use, that we can design machines to kind of hack that and force people to think about unusual stuff in moments where that is potentially effective. Inspire people to try the unusual and trust them to then settle on the combination of unusual and good. So the answer to the question, is an AI going to take your job, is a resounding maybe. It seems like AI might be able to assist, but it's not clear yet whether it'll be able to fully replace you. So that's it for me. That was my last lecture. That was Kaz's last invention. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed learning about some of these things directly related to InfoViz and some of these ideas that more relate to data and algorithms and artificial intelligence that I think are increasingly inseparable from the idea of how we design with information. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what you come up with with your last assignments. I think you've all been an amazing class and I hope that you found the way that we do our lectures useful. If you have, please go to the following URL. I'll put it down the, in the description. Go to the following URL and tell us what you liked. If you didn't like what we were doing, go to this URL and tell us what you didn't like. And for the last time, I'll see you in class. For those who are wondering, yeah, I know I won't see you in class. I don't actually get any face-to-face -face class time this year. That was, that was a joke. <laughs>